I always call myself a divergent because I feel like I never fully fit in. I was always considered not to like make this about my childhood, but I was considered different because I spoke, I speak properly. I speak eloquently, but I'm black. I didn't quote unquote talk black. I didn't play a quote unquote black sport. I was always the only black player on the field and on my team. You know, the thing I like about the blessing of being able to do this podcast is that I get to learn a lot about my friends. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Breaking Through the Glass Ceiling with Brian H. Today's guest, Renee P. Washington, host of Beyond the Headlines. But not only is she a host of her own show, she's also a reporter. On today's show, you'll find out her journey, how she was an all-American athlete who did some PR work and then flipped over into the journalism side. So, ladies and gentlemen, after this, get ready. You will hear from Renee Washington. So, ladies and gentlemen, as promised, I have the one, the only Miss... <laughs> Renee Washington on the line. Uh, Renee does so much. One of the things you should be doing is subscribe to her show behind the headlines. So, Renee, how are you today? I'm great, Brian. Thank you so much for having me on the show. I'm excited for you and this new venture. Oh, I appreciate it. You know, um, like I said, I told people, yeah, I love wrestling. Wrestling podcast isn't going anywhere, but... I wanted to also, you know, talk to my friends and share their life stories. So it wouldn't make sense to do that on a wrestling show. So, right. I mean, you know, they gave me the opportunity to create another network. I mean, I have my own production company, so I'll let that take the reins. <laughs> Therefore, I felt like, hey, this is the perfect opportunity to do it. So, Renee, first and foremost, how are you? I'm good. I'm, I'm excited for the holidays. I'm excited, you know, for the new year, see what it brings. I've got some... As always, New Year's resolutions that I plan to stick to, <laughs> but now nah, all is well. Just grinding, doing, and uh, having some new things in the works myself. So, cannot complain. God is good. Absolutely, all the time. And you know, we look back to 2019, and, and I said that as we had this whole debate at work, where should you say 2019, or as this case now. 2020, or should you say 2020, 2019? <laughs> oh, uh, 2020, 2019. Of okay. <laughs> so we, we we look back at the formal right? way. If, if, if we're, yeah, we say 2019, we're being super formal and proper, but it's 2019 and 2020. Yeah. <laughs> um, one of the things that I found phenomenal that you were doing was covering the AFL, the uh, Arena Football League, while holding down a podcast. Can you kind of let people know how you got into the AFL? Because we hear a lot about NFL reporters, NBA reporters, college basketball, college football, baseball. But talk about how you got into the AFL. Yeah, so um, I saw they originally started announcing openings for jobs and I'm fortunate that where I'm located in New Jersey, like I'll get in the car and drive anywhere, you know, I'll cover whatever. So I was looking at, they had the DC and Baltimore teams. They had the Philly team with the soul. They had the new Atlantic city team. So I was reaching out applying for all of them. I'm like, whatever, you know, it, in my opinion, I, I saw it as a chance to get a really good, it was a good opportunity to get some reps. It's, pro, it's professional indoor arena football. So it's, it's not the NFL, but it's similar, you know, the benefit of co covering like, like college or minor league baseball. You know, it, it allows you to get the professional feel, get those reps in at a, at a professional level without actually being at the professional level, you know. So I, I actually was fortunate that through networking was able to meet someone that works in the AF or worked in the AFL because, unfortunately, the league has folded. Um, but worked in the communication department. So as I was applying and I, I, I was I reached out to her and let her know, you know, like, hey, I'm, I'm applying. Just just a little heads up. Is there anything else I can do? Any, you know, whatever. Trying to trying to find a way to just get in somewhere. Just because for me, I'm always looking to expand. You know, I've covered so many different sports, so many different levels. 
I don't want to, I don't ever look to pass up any opportunities because I feel like every chance is a chance to grow, especially when you're in something that's uncomfortable. So arena football, I'm not fully, I mean, I'm a football fan, don't get me wrong, but I had never, I had never fully invested time to understand the AFL and what it's about. So it was a chance to force me out of my comfort zone, get to know some new teams, some new players, different rules, different formatting. And so through between networking and uh, applying and a lot of phone calls, I was able to get in as a team reporter for the Atlantic City Blackjacks. And it was a great experience. I mean, I enjoyed being an MMJ, basically, is what we were. They don't have the funds, by no surprise, since the league has unfortunately folded uh, due to bankruptcy issues. But they didn't have the funds to have a full camera crew and everything. It was, it was just me. You know, I was out at practices and games covering the team, shooting, editing, getting interviews, doing stand-ups, putting together content my, by my own creative vision, which I really enjoyed as well because I didn't have – the benefit of it is I didn't have a whole crew, so I didn't have anybody telling me we need this, this, and this. This is the time limit we need. This is the deadline. I really had free reign to create the content that I thought made, made most sense. But I, when I thought made most sense, you know, I had full creative control, which I loved. So it was a great opportunity, and it was a, a good chance for me. I mean, I work in college sports. I you know, was working with the Mystics this past summer, and then to be able to add that to my, to my experience. So in that experience, I wouldn't trade for anything at all. It was it was a great experience. Okay. So, yeah, I think that's phenomenal. One of the things that – one of the reasons why I was interested in doing these podcasts, and especially having you on, was because – you said something that I believe a lot of young people need to hear. Cause that's really my targeted audience is mm-hmm. a lot of people who are growing up trying to figure out what they want to do. You know, those people who are in college or people who are in high school. Right. Right. You said being uncomfortable. Mm. When was the first time that you felt, when you realize that it was important for you to be uncomfortable in order to grow professionally? September 7th, 1992. <laughs> <laughs> That's my birthday, by the way. <laughs> um, no, honestly, my the biggest thing that has always helped me is I grew up always uncomfortable. I played soccer. That was my main sport. I mean, I played basketball at a high level. I ran track at a high level. Soccer was my main sport. I always call myself a divergent because I feel like I never fully fit in. I was always considered not to like make this about my childhood, but I was considered different because I spoke, I speak properly. I speak eloquently, but I'm black. I didn't quote unquote talk black. I didn't play a quote unquote black sport. I was always the only black player on the field and on my team. So I've always been in situations where I was forced to be uncomfortable, you know, put in environments where I had to figure out, how to blend in without losing myself, you know, how to be most successful without having to lose myself and, and what I'm, who I am and what I'm about. So professionally, I would say the biggest eye-opening time was in college because that was when I was playing at a really high level and I was, you know, when I became an All-American, I saw different types of success and just figure out how to balance that. But, you know, it, it's always been there. Now as a female, a black reporter, Again, I'm still one of the only black women that I often see on the sidelines or whatever else. So I've always felt like in order to grow and and really figure out who you are as a person, life can't be all sunshines and rainbows and and a silver platter of of all that you want. You know, you got to have moments of adversity, challenges, failure. And I live by that because I've 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 been through that. I failed. I've had you know, a lot of setbacks in my life, but I've been, because of that, I've been able to grow stronger that now at 27, I don't see failures the same way I did as a 17 year old soccer player. You know, I've taken a lot of the lessons that I've learned over the years to help evolve as a person to build my character and my determination that, you know what, I take every moment of discomfort as, as a reminder that I'm doing the right thing. Cause I feel like, and I'm not, I'm not preaching here, but I feel like honestly, When you, when things aren't, when things are getting tough is when you're getting closest to what your goals are and closest to what, what you're pursuing. If things are easy, that means that there's nothing, there's no challenge. That means that you're not working towards anything. But the moment I get uncomfortable and everything seems like it's trying to block me, that's when I'm like the most confident that something great is coming. So I I take it in stride, honestly. And I would say I've dealt with it in every chapter of my life in some way or another. Wow. Hey man, somebody get the collection plate. She just dropped a word. 
Ah, I love you. <laughs> You're too funny. <laughs> I'm just speaking facts. This is what I live. This is what I've been through. You know, I ain't, this is no games, no lies here. <laughs> so you were an athlete. How hard was it to make the transition? When was that moment when you knew that you were not going to play sports forever and it was time to, in your case, hang up your cleats and pick up the mm-hmm. microphone? Yeah, so I would say um, when I was invited into the preseason with Sky Blue to play professional soccer, (laughs) so when I got to Lehigh University and I was pursuing my master's degree, and in those two years, I I had given up playing soccer, I was done, and that was the time where I really took a step back and tried to figure out how can I take all of my experiences. I was a two-sport athlete in college, actually, a lot of people don't know that, and I had about eight internships over the course of my years. And, and, and all those, they were all PR and marketing type internships. So I was doing video editing. I was doing social media management. But none of it was on camera broadcasting. So I felt like I was behind because I hadn't done what my classmates had done. But I really just took everything I knew about sports that I saw as a player and, and molded it into what I wanted to be as a reporter. You know, what, types, what are the types of interviews and segments that I like to watch? What are the things that I enjoy doing and talking about in sports so that I want to see along with the work I had done in PR which was video editing and stuff just on a different level and just started freelance writing I started working in Lehigh sports media department doing their video editing and stuff and just trying to pave my own way to get as much experience in as many different areas as possible so I knew I knew as an undergrad that I wanted to get into sports reporting but I always thought it was too late until I realized it's never too late you know, we're, we're still young and reinventing ourselves. I'm still reinventing myself. So to go back to your original question, <laughs> uh, it was definitely the moment I got to professional soccer and realized, you know what? This is actually not what I want to be doing anymore. You know, I've, I've done all I can do. It's time to move on. Wow. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, we, we talk every day, but a lot of times we're in a group chat. So, you know, we too busy shooting the beep (laughs) that Ah! we we don't always you know engage with you know everybody's life stories so Mm -hmm. for me this is amazing to hear how would you say that um you know after you decided like okay now sports reporter is what i want to do what was some of your biggest obstacles because you were coming into a field where you were familiar from one side, and like you right. said, you knew what type of reporter you wanted to be based on the questions you asked. But how hard was it making that transition from the PR side of things, where essentially you're trying to spin things a lot of times and mm-hmm. make sure the wrong thing doesn't get out, to now jumping into where you ultimately digging for the dirt? Yeah. Yeah, that was that was tough. I mean, I'm, honestly, what one of the things I did was I just and I've always been like this with everything that I'm passionate about. I've always studied it, you know, like I always sit and I don't watch games the same way other people watch games. Now, I still scream at my TV like everybody else. But I mean, in terms of like why I'm watching, I'm watching more to see, you know, what's going on, what's going on around the court. That's why I, whenever I go to a game, I feel so ADHD because I'm like looking all over the place. But I always am like watching what what's the sideline reporter doing? What's the play-by-play analyst doing? You know, what's, what are they saying? What am I hearing? What am I seeing? What would I think is a storyline that, that should be told? So that's something where I just started studying. You know, I started watching broadcasters, whether it was anchors, sideline reporters, whatever it was, seeing what I, what I liked, seeing what I didn't like, because a lot of learning is also figuring out who you, and figuring out who you are is figuring out what you don't like to see. You know, the way people ask questions or how they stand or how they how they're dressed, things like that. And just starting to figure out what my identity would be as a sports personality. And just started, to, I honestly just took the next step of it was I took what was my dream job at the time, which was working on ESPN as an anchor. And I found, okay, what are the things that they're looking for? What boxes do I need to have checked? And I literally just started working to check those boxes. You know, a job that I would love to have at the time, which was in 2014, um, five, six years from then, and just look to start checking off boxes. Okay, they want this, so let me, how can I get that? And literally just started creating opportunities where I could 
get the experience I needed. So maybe I didn't have one job that gave me everything, but I could piece together different jobs to get as much and get as close as I could. So it was just a matter of studying, grinding. I haven't stopped since I started the grind. Um, and just kind of figuring out, you know, what's it going to look like for me to be able to get those reps and even things like I created a YouTube channel. I created my own website. I started freelance writing and blogging and just trying to build up my own personality and my brand as who I am as a sports personality. Yeah. And I have to say, I'm going to take this time to give you props to say you've done a phenomenal job. Why, uh, thank you. you. You've, you've, no, it's no, you know, it's, it's real. You have a way of keeping your audience entertained while still delivering the news. That's always not easy to do. Um, when did you decide that, you know, you wanted to start your podcast? Yeah, so I had, um, it actually was like baby steps because I had a show, The Sports Break, which is my first show that was my own. And that was with just a local digital station. And through that, I kind of was able to create my own vision of what I wanted a sports show to look like. But I just felt like it wasn't reaching the the audience. It wasn't reaching the um, access and, and things like it just wasn't enough. It wasn't it wasn't as, as strong as I wanted it to be. So the next step was when I had a uh, company reach out to me to do a, a podcast on their show. And again, it was it was a it was it was a stepping stone. There was. More, wow. there are more resources, a bigger audience, bigger team around me. Um, but it still didn't feel, you know, like the perfect fit. So that became the sports break, became the sports rap. <laughs> and then from mm-hmm. there, as I created what is now Beyond the Headlines with Renee Washington. And I felt like this was a chance, because it is through Fox Sports, for me to have more credibility, a bigger name. You know, as soon as you name drop Fox Sports, it doesn't matter if it's a DC affiliate or, or where else. It, it has a lot more pull to it, and it's a, a lot more um, highly recognized. So I knew I wanted to create something that was my own because I just felt like with everything that I was doing, I still wasn't fully getting out who I am as a person and the stories I like to tell. And, you know, when you, you know this, when you work for someone else, it, you have to be under their creative control. You know, what do they want? What's their deadlines? What's their... What's their digital content plan and everything like that? And I wanted to have my own plan and my own vision. And there were so many stories I felt like that just were not being told. And I wanted to find a way to bring those to light. So I created what is now beyond the headlines where it is is exactly as it says. And we're taking stories beyond the headlines instead of all the trending topics, which we talk about too. We'll get into Lamar Jackson and whatever else is going on, but also hearing stories of triumph, similar to what you're doing. Stories of overcoming adversity, you know, stories of people that are out in the community doing good things or athletes that maybe we always see just their accolades. But let's get to know who they are and how they got to where they are, as well as music. So I just try to tie in a lot of different things that, again, what would I always go back to as a when any with any type of content I create? What would I like to see if I can't watch it or listen to it? How the heck do I expect someone else to? (laughs) So, like, what is it that I would want to see and hear and and someone, you know, that would really attract a wide variety of people? And I feel like with each show, I kind of expanded a little bit more to try to reach more people. So maybe you don't like soccer, but you like basketball or you like music or, you you know, what you like my positive eyes only segment, like something that can entice people to want to keep coming back each week. Yeah, definitely. So, ladies and gentlemen, right now, while we have your attention, (laughs) go on wherever you get your podcast and if you're on your phone you can still listen while mm-hmm. you do this make sure you search beyond the headlines with renee washington and subscribe hit the subscribe button and drop thank five you. star ratings <laughs> thank you <laughs> appreciate it <laughs> so the title of this show is called breaking through glass ceilings when was the moment that mm. you renee washington broke through the glass ceiling which glass ceiling there I've broke I feel like I break through them with every chapter <laughs> um oh I think as a as a player it was when I um became an all-american because it was a moment where I had been um my dad actually coached me growing up so I was under a lot of scrutiny and a lot of um a lot of people were kind of downplaying my abilities as a soccer player because they were just saying it was because my dad was coaching me, even though he wasn't the one on the field. I have no idea how that would translate. He wasn't the one scoring goals, but whatever. 
Um, <laughs> and so that was the moment where I was like, I am actually good. You know, and then I had that moment again in my career when I um, landed my first full time job after grad school and actually had someone that I was so fortunate to my boss at the time who I was going through the interview process, applying to all of these different jobs, just trying to get my foot in the door somewhere, trying to get someone to take a chance on me. And through the interview process for a copy editor role, they were like, uh, you wouldn't enjoy this job at all. You'd be miserable. You'd hate it. This is not for you. So we're going to actually create an internship for you since I was still in grad school. And they're like, and if you enjoy it you know, and it works out, you can come on full time. So that was a role doing news anchoring. I was doing like six segments a day. I was a sports MMJ out at high school games. I was on one of the panelists on our weekly sports shows. That, I, that was a moment where I really was like, you know what, I can actually do this. I saw people's feedback. I was, I was out at games and out in the community and out at events and people were coming up to me and they recognized me and they were giving me, you know, they were speaking highly of my work. It was the moment I felt like, okay, maybe I really can do this. You know, I can actually make this happen. And then also, I guess when I was afforded the opportunity to start working with Fox Sports, because I had already been working with ESPN, granted, I'm not at the mainstream ESPN or Fox Sports. I'm not sitting there with Skip Bayless or, or anybody else, any big names yet, like I hope to be. But that was the moment where I was like, I, I had quit my job with the NLL and taken a leap of faith. I had already been working with ESPN, and now here I was also working with Fox Sports and had a show through them. And these were goals of mine, to get into professional sports, to get into TV, to get into big name networks. And I, there I was slowly chipping things away, and I've only been at an undergrad. Uh, it's been five years since I graduated from LaSalle and three from Lehigh. And to see how fast that all turned around, when you really look in hindsight, that's not a lot of time. Um, it was really a moment that was like, okay, you know what, I'm actually... I'm on the right track. I'm doing the right thing. And I can really make this happen. So it's been moments of like cracking through the glass ceiling and continuing to chip away at it. And I feel like I, I just burst through with each chapter, like another moment, in my opinion, breaking through the glass ceiling, a moment of like understanding and affirmation that I'm here. I'm where I need to be. I'm doing the right things and I'm on the right path. So my latest this past summer, my next one, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, and you know, it's it's crazy. Like, as close as we are, our paths, you know, just missed each other with the uh, Fox Sports. Um, but I have to say this: I was happy to see you know you join because I, you know it's no secret. And one day I'll share the story on this podcast um, how it was a lot. I've spent a lot of time and effort and. You know, you if you listen to episodes two and three, you hear Kelsey, Nicole Nelson, and Brandon Williams. Uh, you know, two other members of what we call the Fab Five. Um, <laughs> you'll hear them discuss how we, you know, how like you know they were part of the. I want to say the infancy of it when we was building the brand, and. You know, I had to step away, but when I saw you come aboard, I was like, okay, this is great because I knew what you had did before. You know, we had just mm. met and I had already, you know, started getting acclimated with the sports rap. So I knew that you was bringing credibility. You saying it's added credibility to you, but you brought <coughs> Fox Sports credibility as well. So because I knew you was about your business. So I was, you know, particularly happy to see that. I want to talk about the National Association of Black Journalists. Mm. This is actually 2017, New Orleans, when we first met uh, in the line, if you remember, <laughs> in the line, get ready to go to the yes. sports task force party. <laughs> I knew in New Orleans, New Orleans. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's funny because uh, people, will say, I'm actually supposed to be there in a few weeks, but people from New Orleans said, we don't even say it like that. <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> they absolutely do <laughs> but I want you to talk about how much the organization has had an impact on you because at, at any time and I'm going to let people know now that any time I have a fellow NABJ member I am going to have them share their stories because it's been a blessing to me I know it's been a blessing to my friends and I want other people to hear how it's been a blessing to them. Just in case there's some people on the <laughs> fence about joining. So could you share how NABJ has been a blessing to you? Where do I begin? I mean, 
I think the, the biggest thing is a lot of people get into these um, organizations and networking opportunities looking for a job. And it's almost like, can you give me a job? And I always tell people, that's not, that's not the purpose of networking. The networking and the opportunities I've received through NABJ go beyond what a job could give me. You know, for starters, I've, I've seen this is my third year. So New Orleans was my very first year with NABJ. Oh, that and was that your time, first? That was my very first <laughs> that, year. That was and a good was, first. It was a great first. That's Oh, yeah. Set the bar very high. Broke the glass ceiling. Set the bar very high. I honestly was um, nervous. I was terrified. I felt like I, again, I, I feel like it was people we always tend to like um overcomplicate things and 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 get scared and overthink things at least I do so I was like oh god I don't know if I'm ready for this not even realizing or, or keeping in mind the fact that you have a wide range from students high school and college students all the way up so I definitely belong but to go there and have conversations and meet people and see how how well how much I was welcomed and how well received I was but what made it even better was as the years progressed and I look back on this past year I'm now on a first name basis with a lot of people and that work in not even just on on air talent, but producers and directors and hiring managers, HR people that work at ESPN, NBC, Fox Sports, you know, and not only do they know me on a first name basis, we're having conversations about how's your kids doing? Not my kids, their kids. I don't have kids. How's your kids doing? You know, they're asking me about how things are going with me. They're also saying, oh, yeah, I just saw you did this, this and this. So to, to have that moment where it's like, not only do you remember me, and these are people you don't see in between the, the conferences. You see them once a year, some of them. And to see the fact that these, they not only remember who I am, they're following me. They're, and they're following so closely they can tell me, oh, I saw that you were here. I saw that you did this. I saw this show. I'm like, wow, who am I? Like, I'm just, here I am just a, a little soccer girl just trying to find my way through. And who am I to have people from these nationally or, I'm sorry, globally recognized networks that are keeping up with, with my journey? So beyond just the networking and the people I've been able to meet and now call my mentors or like, like you, Brian, that I can call family, you know, I also have, it, it's also such a great moment because it's like we get to come together as successful journalists that are still on the rise, still chasing our dreams. But we get to check in with each other. We get to, you know, keep up with what we're doing. We get to update each other and to see, see what, you know, how we progress from one year to the next. I look back last year at this time, I wasn't even working with the NLL yet. I was still working with the, the South Jersey station that I was with on TV, SNJ Today. Um, and I, like, I'm like, wow, like a year ago at the conference to a year later, here I am, like two jobs later, all these changes I have happened house now I've got this that you know like I was able to to look at how much I progressed so it's also a great moment of reflection along with celebration partying you know all that networking all in a week it's it's incredible I I, I always tell anybody find an organization to join and if you're if you're black NABJ if you're Hispanic NAHJ if you're whatever you know find something to join because if you can find one really good organization like NABJ it is life changing. I mean, I wouldn't, it has done so much for me in my career and personally, just to give me that confidence that we're out here and people can see our grind. Mm -hmm. So I love it. Certainly. So what's Hashtag next? Hashtag no regrets. <laughs> <laughs> so, what's um, next so part of when I, oh, what's next? That's a great question. I have a lot going on right now. Um, <laughs> When I first, when I first um, took a step back, which was back in May, when I did leave the NLL and decide that I had to make a move that I thought was best for my career, I, I wanted to make sure that I was still moving in the right direction. So I've, as mentioned, you know, I picked up more through ESPN. I'm doing more with Fox and hopefully going to be doing more this winter with them. Um, I also have been, I don't know when this exact date that this airs, because it's episode four, so I'm trying to do the math in my head quickly. Um, but, you know, I also was afforded the opportunity to join LaSalle's broadcast team, so I'm going to be an in-arena host for them. That's unofficial news. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and it's secret. It hasn't been announced yet, but uh, I'll be joining them. I just started joining another um, outlet where I'll be writing articles for them on the NBA, WNBA college sports called belly up sports and just did an interview actually with LaChina Robinson. 
um, I'm just I'm just out here grinding and hustling. You know, I might actually be dipping my toes into the entertainment side. I've been in the works of talking to some some people about hosting or co-hosting a hip hop, music, and entertainment show. I've been modeling. I had a fashion show, which by the time this airs will be after the fashion show. Uh, that to close out this the 2019 year and some <laughs> photo shoots and stuff starting in 2020. So I'm honestly what my biggest thing is I don't want to pigeonhole myself. And I know in a lot of conversations I've had, um, people always ask, what's your ultimate career goal? I don't know, because careers are always changing. The way that we receive our news is always changing. So I'm going to make sure I'm as versatile and as well-rounded as possible, because if, if an opportunity is called over here, that's not in sports or an opportunity in sports, whatever it is, I want to be ready. So I'm trying to expand and, and just do it, do as much that I enjoy doing uh, without stretching myself too thin. <laughs> Now, a lot. I get asked this question a lot, and I know I have to ask you: How do you? When and how do you sleep? <laughs> um, you know what? I sleep. I feel like a a camel or a bear, like a bear. I feel like bears like how they hibernate and they just sleep for like a couple months and then they go back at it. Like like right now is like a downtime for me in December, and mm-hmm. I'm fortunate that I actually have a lot of control over my schedule. Like I, I can do and, and control like where I'm going to be at, when, when I'm doing what. So I try to take time like out of the year. I'll take like one time in the winter, one time in the summer where I just shut down because I also actually coach soccer. Not a lot of people know that. I have three soccer teams that I coach. So I do a lot of different things. So I try to schedule it where there's a time like right now is my quote unquote downtime where I'm not coaching, I'm not reporting as much, I'm still doing stuff, but not as much. I'm kind of laying low and sleeping more, spending more time with my family and friends. And then come January, I'll be back at 100 miles per hour not sleeping. So I, I try to like schedule sleep, sleep weeks. <laughs> okay. Because I don't drink coffee either. So I don't sleep much, I don't drink coffee. I just run on adrenaline and God. <laughs> so. Wow, well, make sure you do get the, um, your sleep time in because it will catch up with you. That's what they tell me. Yes. I, I well, pay... I'm, yes. <laughs> What's your, well, what do you do to sleep? Uh, you know, that's a good question because usually I might be, I go to work and I'll be editing until, you know, 12 or 1 in the morning yeah. or catch it up on TV and then get up at 6. Um, but usually Saturdays I'm, fairly decent and Sundays is getting up to go to church or if I got to work a game. So, you know, uh, I catch up on it. <laughs> yeah. And that's how I am. I mean, I honestly, there are a lot of weeks and, and honestly a lot of stretches out of the year where I'm, I am working seven days out of the week. There's no off day, but I wouldn't change that. Cause I feel like that's just my personality. So it's not, doesn't feel like work to me as so cliche as that is like, I enjoy it. And for me, the relaxation comes when I get a chance to sit down and watch like a Hallmark Christmas movie or catch up on my shows or like do something that's slower paced. That's I'm not asleep, but I'm relaxing when I can slow down and just kind of be in the moment, shut my phone off and just chill. But yeah, I mean, look, you only live one life. You got plenty of time to sleep when you're old and retired. So <laughs> <laughs> that's my and, outlook on it. <laughs> and, and, and cut up in a group chat. And caught up in the group chat. Exactly. One time when I'm actually talking in the group chat, you know that's I'm on downtime. Right. <laughs> that's me being off. <laughs> which is which is crazy because a lot of times you and Brandon will be going back and forth and, and, and you know, Ashley and I might be working. And then when mm. y'all we're off, y'all going at, and then Keto know. Kelsey will jump in here and there. So And I'll be quick to put all my group chats and threads on social media and on my phone on Do Not Disturb. Right. <laughs> so when it's not on, once I catch up, I'm good. <laughs> yeah, why well, we get ready to let you go? But real quick, you brought up a Christmas movie. What's your favorite Christmas movie of all time? I Ooh. know it's over, but you know. First of all, your... I'm a Christmas. I'm obsessed with Christmas. Likewise. <laughs> I uh, yes, like I every single. That's why December is my downtime because I'm I'm off. I'm just sitting there watching my Hallmark Christmas movies or Lifetime Christmas movies, whatever. Favorite Christmas movie? Uh. I love the Grinch. I like the new Grinch with Pharrell. Have you seen that? No, nah, I haven't. Oh, that's it's really good. Because you know what? It's more diverse. Some of okay. the, um, a lot of the people in Whoville are 
They're different sizes, tall, fat, skinny, short, whatever, black, mixed, like they're different tones. It's not all the like blonde hair, blue eye people in Whoville. They have better music. Tyler, the creator. So shout out to the new Grinch because I think that might be number one right now. Okay. Um, but I don't know. I still like the classics, like the those old 90s, like the Santa Claus, Kris Kringle, Rudolph type movies, Frosty Snowman. But they're just hard to find. They're never on. Yeah. I don't know what happened to them. <laughs> and then there's like This Christmas with Chris Brown. Who doesn't love that movie? I know, right? I don't know. I don't know if I have just one, actually. I have to like really... I might have to binge watch a whole bunch to see what my favorite is. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> All right, cool. All right, so let the people know where they can find you and where they can get your show. Absolutely. So I am everywhere. Um, you can check out my website I have, ReneePWashington.com. You can also follow me on social media. I'm on Twitter at Renee P. Wash because my full name does not fit. I am on Facebook and Instagram at Renee P. Washington, all one word. And then also my show Beyond the Headlines with Renee Washington is also on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. So definitely you can give me a follow. I follow back too. You heard what she said, folks. She follows <laughs> back. You know what I'm going to tell you? Don't be a creep. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Please thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much for joining. I'm, you know, I'm certainly proud of you. And, you know, I can't wait. Um, you know, we got some works in the making that people don't know about. Just people need to just stay tuned. For so sure. yeah, definitely looking forward to NABJ in DC, but I'm certain that we will see each other before then. Of course, we're family. Family now. Exactly. You better see family reunion. <laughs> Time for one. Right. It definitely is. <laughs> but thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure getting to talk about my journey and uh, take a little trip down memory lane. But I, I really appreciate you having me not only on the show, but in one of your first five episodes. So I'll take that. That's a huge, <laughs> huge honor. Thank you. I appreciate you joining me. All right, folks, so thank you for tuning in to another edition of Breaking Through Glass Ceilings with Brian H. Make sure you are subscribed to the podcast if you have not done so already. Make sure you drop a five-star rating, you know? I really appreciate that. It helps get the word out there. It helps me climb the rankings in iTunes and Spotify. Well, I guess I should say apple podcast that's the formal name for it now and then also check out my other show break it down with brian h that's the wrestling show so until the next time folks do not let anyone set a glass ceiling above your head